And this was especially prevalent during COVID, the pandemic. And, but we also talked, we didn't just talk about the challenges, but we talk about things that people can do come an effective leader and to stand strong. Because for one thing, we spoke about the importance of having a support group because too many people try to make this journey on their own. And you can't do that because you will burn yourself out. You'll get depressed and everything. You need somebody that's gonna stand there and hold you up, keep you grounded, keep you encouraged. At the same time, they're gonna offer you constructive criticism to help make you a strong leader. The other thing we talked about was the importance of continuing your education because so many people make the mistake of thinking that, well, my education, I got my MLS, I don't need to do anything else. No, you need to keep working because some of you know who are in the profession with the advanced way technology is advancing. If you don't keep up with what's going on, you're gonna be obsolete. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be out of a job because you're gonna, you're competing with other people who have skills, who have the skill set that employers are looking for. And you need to continue your education because you want to be able to have that edge when you're looking for a job. And the other thing we talked about was the importance of service. Leadership is more than just being a director. You can be a leader by being a co-chair, mm -hmm. by being a mentor, um, contributing to the professional literature, writing blogs, um, doing research. And lastly, we also talked about advocating for more African-Americans in leadership positions. Um, especially among directors. If you know somebody in your, in your um, institution that wants to be a leader, take them and mentor them. And then too, as far as try to recruit leaders too, but when you recruit, don't recruit people and forget about them. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's that's cause you see people just, they wanna check off boxes. Oh, we got our diversity hired. And then they just forget about them. And that person's like, well, what am I here? What am I, how am I going to handle this? I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm new to this institution. I don't know anybody. I don't know what's expected of me. I don't feel appreciated or welcome. And then you wonder why they leave. And so leaders need to do their, um, directors need to do their part as far as recruitment. Also, one, I'm going to close with this. I also employ directors that when you, um, before you even think about recruiting people, do a diagnosis do a diagnostic inspection of your institution before you even think about bringing somebody in because mm. it's not enough that you're on board for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Your staff has to be on board too. Look at the atmosphere, look at the environment. Is it really welcome? And be honest, how, how are my staff really on board with diversity, equity, and inclusion? If they aren't, then you need to take charge and do something with that because otherwise, you can, if you're trying to recruit leaders and managers and supervisors, even support staff, they're not going to stay at your institution if they have to deal with all this hostile working environment and stuff from other employees. That's all I want to say. Uh, Michelle, can you share the name of your blog? Because I want people to really know. Okay. Uh, my blog is called Little Known Black Librarian Facts. And the inspiration with that was Dr. Um, Tom Joyner. <laughs> he used to have this um, show on the radio called Little Known Black Librarian Facts. And when I would drive to work every morning, I would listen to it. So I said, hmm how could I do this with a librarian? So I started doing a little blog and it's been going around about almost 11 years. Yeah. So I've got a lot of comments on it. It's amazing. It's a so great everybody resource. definitely check it out. Everyone wants to check it out. Yeah. Little known black librarian facts yes. by Michelle Fenton. Check it out. I know you yes. have your phone. Uh, well, we're talking about black librarianship. I'm going to look at Shannon Bland down there who has this amazing uh, social media IG page highlighting Black librarianship. So please tell us about your chapter. Yes, yeah, so I, um, as I said earlier, um, I'm on the chapter with Laquana Onyeme on uh, building community through digital innovation. Um, so as Shantae mentioned, I do have um, the Black Librarians Instagram page and that page was born just out of me just being on Instagram randomly, following a lot of other Black pages, you know, like this is the Black teacher's page, this is Black gardener's page. I was like, hey, where's the Black librarian's page? <laughs> And, you know, I have a group chat with a uh, fellow Black librarian colleagues, one of them in the, in the audience right now. So really all it was, is like a little uh, passion project, a little labor of love that grew from like our little group chat to be this big platform to span, you know, across states, across countries on Instagram, um, which at the time I didn't know when I started it in 2018, how needed it would be in the past two years <laughs> with the pandemic 
and not being able to really see each other in person physically and build those relationships, come to in-person conferences like this. So I didn't even know what was in store for me, <laughs> um, you know, within building um, this platform. And I've gotten to meet wonderful colleagues like everybody I'm up on uh, stage with now. And a lot of them I'm just meeting in person for the first time <laughs> after having multiple conversations online. So it's just crazy to think, um, you know, how much has uh, changed in our world just in the past two years um, due to circumstances. But a lot of times that's where the best results come from is working with what you got and dealing with certain circumstances. Um, you know, that's that's how things come to be that uh, fulfill a need. Um, my co-author on the chapter, Laquando Nyemi, she started WOC Plus Lib as a platform, a digital platform for uh, people to get their scholarly work published. Because um, those, um, you know, in the world of academia, it could be a struggle, um, you know, as a person of color to get your to get your work published. So that was a platform that she started to build within that community, so people will at least have the opportunity to get their foot in the door. Um, Cause you know, those are the type of things that you need when you're going in certain aspects of the field. So um, we came together and started brainstorming and basically we, we told our stories, you know, we, we shared our experience um, and how uh, we saw a need and how we came to uh, come up with the ideas for our, for our platforms. And just basically talking about the importance of community. Um, it's so few of us, it's a lot of us in this room, but it's so few of us when you look at the, the bigger scope of the field of librarianship. It's uh, still a very, very, very white field. So it's important for um, um, those of us, um, our, our Black librarians, to tap in with each other and even reach out. One of my goals with the Instagram page is to even show people that are not even thinking about librarianship that it's even an option. Um, with me, I didn't know anything about librarianship. I just fell into the job because I didn't have a job. <laughs> and I would go to the library to job search. And one day I went to the library to job search. It popped up on their website because that's where the internet would open up to when I was using their Wi-Fi that they had a job opening. And that's how I fell into the field of librarianship the field of librarianship. So I think it's very important to even reach out to those outside of the field and that mentorship piece that they spoke about already is so key. And uh, that's my whole goal, just to bring awareness and show folks what Black librarianship looks like. Because a lot of people, they don't even know what the library itself as a as an entity really is in this time. You know, I hear often people like, oh, y'all are still around. <laughs> like, so <laughs> I think it's so important to just raise awareness. Uh, so that's that's uh, what we talked about in our chapter, um, you know, bringing awareness, um, building a digital community, you know, the non-traditional uh, community, because I mean, nowadays we got all, all these verses, the you know, the metaverses, all this stuff is like, <laughs> like eventually, you know, these uh, these digital platforms and spaces and environments, it's like, wow, this is, is this is really uh, just to see how much has changed just in the past few years and why it's important to build community both, you know, in person, but also virtually and digitally as well. Um, I have the... Um, the, I call it a blessing of living in a, an environment where I see people that look like me all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I live in Maryland. Maryland, there's a lot of predominantly black space, um, places in Maryland, but that is not the case for most of the United States. So I love when I get messages uh, from people saying, thank you, thank you for building this community because I'm the only one that looks like me in the place that I work at. So that's, that's the type of thing that, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> but just at the end of the day, somebody can say, thank you. I feel represented, that, that's, that's enough for me. Uh, so that's uh, some of the things we talk about in the chapter and you know, kind of just looking at where we've been and looking at the future of uh, the digital, community and realm when it comes to librarianship. Well, thank you. So just to, to talk about community, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association has been building that community for over 50 years. And this is the reason why it's very important for us to come together, not just in the virtual space, but 
physically. It's so great to see that we all have legs and, and a whole body and not and outside of the squares. So with that being said, I do want to give kudos to Dr. Ndumu who came to me with this idea around the book to commemorate the 50th anniversary. And I just wanna hear from all of the editors about our community while editing this book and, and that whole process. Cause I was scared when, when Dr. Ndumu said, I was like, I don't know about this, but. <laughs> and I'm looking at you cause I don't remember it that way. <laughs> I, I believe I, we had a conversation but I'm gonna give you the credit that this idea for Boy, sure. you're too kind. I remember all of us really just as a collective coming together and saying, you know, there's so much going on in this moment. It was the 50th anniversary. And um, then we can't forget, and I'm sure you cannot forget just all of the tumult around 2020 and the displacement, the hurt, the pain. And for me, I think um, being in the Elias classroom and, you know, Sekou wrote a previous chapter, but I think a lot of the previous um, books were kind of looking at black librarians in sort of a traditional light or traditional settings. So the black librarian in academic libraries and black librarian in school libraries and uh, public libraries, black library leaders or directors. But um, as we started talking, I was like, you know, I think we need to think about many different intersections of Black librarians, Black librarians who are digital innovators, digital risk takers, which is what I think Laquanda and Shannon are. Um, and then we have Black librarians who are maybe at the intersection of disability. What about LGBTQ? And I think we, in the past iteration, iterations, looked at Black librarians in work settings, like a very functional role. Mm -hmm. And I think when we expand that and look at the vastness of black identity period, and we always say we're not a monolith, but then our richness was exposed in 2020, our strength was exposed in 2020. And I thought that this would be a very, a very poignant time to capture everything that was happening in the field um, and I think we all agreed. So I think it was a consensus, Shantae. I'm I'll gonna push okay. back on that. Okay. <laughs> and I think, you know, us as editors, it, it, was, it wasn't work. It, it really just felt like um, the people were so raw in their chapters. I was blown away with just the transparency. I think everyone, it was cathartic for a lot of authors. So reading just how much they poured in Michelle's chapter, Shannon's chapter, and what everyone brought to it, we literally only had one dropout. Yeah. And that's unheard of in a, in a book. So I think that this book, um, you know, it was a, a divine time, um, whatever your religious colors are, it was just a divine time for this book. Absolutely. Can you talk about your interview with uh, Mr. Wedgford? Oh, absolutely. Um, so you're going to, I can't decide which one is my favorite chapter, and it's not because I wrote the chapter, I promise. But Dr. Robert Wedgworth, um, he's just such an incredible professional. And um, we don't have a specific chapter on Black male librarianship, but we, we didn't want to make that so obvious, but his chapter would be it. And um, Dr. Wedgworth, so we went to dinner with someone last night, Chandra and I, and they were like, Tracy Hall is the first Black executive director. I was like, no, she's the Black, first mm -hmm. Black female executive director. Dr. Wedgworth was the first. And this is in the 1970s when there was a lot of flux in ALA and um, the social responsibilities table was being born, what later became emerit. There's a lot of change. Of course, you know, ALA was really pressured to force states that wanted to stay segregated to kick them out of the association. So anyway, here comes um, a, a, a real movement to get the first black executive director. So he was tapped, he took the role. Um, and under his tenure, he took ALA from the red, deep red, they were in a lot of debt into the black, he purchased the building in Chicago that would help ALA to thrive, um, changed governance, and really transformed the organization. Um, and that's a big, big feat as a Black man in the 1970s. Then he went on to direct the Columbia Library School. 
and he did not have the same success there. In fact, the first library school in the country actually sundown under his watch. And I think he was very disappointed. He might actually be watching. So hi, Dr. Wedgworth. And actually, if you wrote a chapter too, would you just wave your hand if you're one of the chapter authors? Um, okay, I just want to make sure to give everybody a shout if they were one of the chapter authors. Um, anyway, so, so Dr. Wedgworth went on to lead the Columbia Library School. Keep in mind that Columbia University in the 1920s during a Harlem Renaissance did not want, quote unquote, a black problem. So they pressured ALA to start an all black library school down in Virginia, Hampton Institute, because they did not want to accept the likes of, you know, Langston Hughes and all of these luminaries, right? So to think that a hundred years later, um, Dr. Wedgworth would lead the school, um, but ultimately a lot of schools closed around that time. Emory, um, Brigham Young, a lot of wonderful library schools closed. So it wasn't, but it was a blow to the, to the profession to have the first library school closed. So he was very open about the politics that went into that, how LIS is not respected in higher education. Oftentimes, and I can say as a professor, it's very hard to stay in the library space and not have to transform into the technology space. And so um, that chapter, it was, um, someone said passion project. It was a joy to write that chapter. Please read it. Um, he went on to do so much more and he is, his career was so elastic and dynamic. And it just shows again, instead of librarian, black librarians in one setting, how, um, how, just incredibly diverse we are, even in one career, you can be, you can just be so elastic. So that's, that, that was a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Walker, do you want to talk about your chapter? Okay, I think that's a little better. Um, so my chapter, but before I start remarks about the chapter, I wanted to um, also, also, you saw the video of Dr. Carla Hayden, uh, she sort of led out with a forward for this book. And there's a quote I heard from her back in 2017 at the ACRL conference, and I'll improvise. But basically what she said was, what can I do? How can I serve? And how can I make what I do as a librarian mean something? And so I think this volume in particular, as my colleague Anna and others have alluded to, when we were in the midst of the pandemic and we were trying to figure out, you know, what could we do? How could we make what we do as librarians mean something? This was a natural response and it followed the trajectory of the other Black Librarian American books that have been published since 1970. And so I think in that way, it really just carried forward that tradition. So my chapter, um, also I wanted to mention, um, sort of segueing off of what Shannon said, um, if you look back at these, uh, the various editions of this book across the years, the Black Caucus has been a space um, that has provided opportunities for Black librarians when maybe there weren't opportunities for us. And so whether it's in terms of service or leadership or in publishing. And so I was very pleased to be a part of this process because it gave a platform for Black librarians who may otherwise find it challenging to have their topics um, you know, receive well in the traditional academic, uh, in the traditional library publishing space. And so again, to be a part of that was very, very meaningful to me. Um, very quickly, my chapter was about a little known black librarian by the name of Adela Hunt Logan. Um, she's native of Sparta, Georgia, which is actually where my family comes from, which is in the middle of Georgia area. And uh, she was Tuskegee Institute's uh, first librarian. Um, she's known also for her work with women's suffrage um, she was a member of the Tuskegee Women's Club, which of course was founded by Booker T. Washington's uh, second wife. And she was responsible for creating a suffrage library in Tuskegee, Alabama at the turn of the century. Um, the Tuskegee Women's Club also established a public library in downtown Tuskegee that many people don't know about. Um, of course, you know, she was a, a woman um, operating in the academic space at that time. And once she got married and had children, she had to sort of take on some other roles, but she was a huge advocate for women's suffrage. And for me, it was a pleasure to highlight her work. Um, I wanted to put her among who I feel like are her contemporaries, black women like um, Nella Larson, Audre Lorde. Librarianship has been a space for black women traditionally um, to serve as librarians, but also to do other work. And so it was a real pleasure 
um, for me to highlight her work. I also edited the first section of the book, which is called A, a Rich Heritage. Um, it talks about Black library history. So just laying the foundation um, and recognizing some of the forerunners and people who have gone before us who have made the work that we do possible and just talking about their sacrifice. So working in that particular section of the book was very fulfilling for me. Thank you. So now with that being said, uh, incoming president, Michelle M. Hayes, talk, tell everyone about the significance of BCALA, the history and the future that you see for uh, Black librarianship. Thank you so much, current president. Shantae Burns Simpson. This is our running joke back and forth. She's got it counted down like to the minute where she's going to hand over the gavel, but I'm going to really miss her. And I'll just take a point of personal privilege to say that I've learned so much uh, from the president in the last two years. Uh, I can truly say she is my friend. She is my sister. I'm the TT to her kids. And uh, we've just grown so close uh, in the work that we've done. And I just really count it an honor and a privilege to work with her. So let's please give her a round so I will say that being a part of an organization uh, that is at this point 52 years uh, young and to look back at our history, um, to look back at Effie Lee Morris and E.J. Josie, who are just one of many people uh, that started our organization. Um, and to see the things that they were challenged with and the accomplishments they made, and then to see where we are right now. And so uh, these are the people on whose shoulders that we stand. And it is our charge uh, for us to take the baton and continue it on. And I feel as though that we're doing this right now, we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, just before this session, um, Dr. Chandra and Dr. Anna, uh, convened a session with iBlack Caucus, which is for MILS students. If you're one of the students, please just wave. Oh, Ooh, wow, lots of them yeah. here. Good to see you, thank you. And so this is a way to build community uh, across library schools uh, in a virtual aspect to support them, uh, to give them leadership opportunities, uh, mentors. Um, and so this is the future. Uh, this is where we're going. And something I wanted to piggyback on uh, based on what Shannon said on bringing more black people into the field, it's important that you understand why that's important. It's not just numbers, it's just not another black face. We as a profession have to represent the communities that we serve. I'll say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> we have to represent the communities we serve. And so we can't continue to have the same numbers over and over and over again, people are still graduating from library school and you're saying, I can't find anyone. Let's search in your heart of hearts. It's not that you can't find anyone, it's that you're not hiring them. And so um, as Michelle Fenton just mentioned, you know, do an evaluation of your organization. Are you ready for this DEI work or is it just a statement you put on the website during the unrest? Or is this really something that's actionable? And so um, I'm excited about where we're going uh, for the future. I'm excited about our conference next year. It'll be in Cal 12. Uh, I'm excited about having 1,100 members. I'm excited about engaging those members, but we need everyone to be a part of that. And so what I would do uh, for everyone that's in the room and actually in the virtual space, are you a member of the Black Caucus? And if you are not, why not? We take allies, everyone can be a member, everyone can serve, everyone can help. We need all hands on deck. And so as it was stated before uh, by uh, Baba Seku, uh, answer the call when it goes out. We need a committee chair, we need a committee member, we need help at the booth. Uh, if not now, when, if not who, you. And so I think we all have to search within ourselves and say, what can I do to make the profession better? And for me, my platform is the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And I count it an honor and a privilege uh, to serve alongside all these amazing professionals. Thank you. Are we ready for questions? Does anybody have a question for our panelists? Come on down. Oh, well, if we can hear you, let's just, okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, thank you. I know an accountant and we served on the ULC Partners in Education during the pandemic. Yes. We're still serving, but it's so good. And congratulations to both of you uh, to being friends and serving together. Um, what is so many things that my new friend here was talking about even before you all started um, talking about what we need to do. What we need to do, mentorship, definitely. Um, taking care of one another on the job. Amen. And not acting like because you know you're in separation, I'm in information that we cannot come together. Right now. Mm -hmm. That right. classism that even we set up. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need to be honest about that and own it yeah. and uh, do our own work within ourselves. gathering together, we were able to, thank you, we were able to um, meet and now become honorary members of Black Caucus Maryland Library Association. And thank you for that. Um, and a couple of weeks ago past, we went to our first meeting and we broke out into breakout sessions and we talked about what we can do. And my passion is definitely growing our own, doing the work so that people will know about librarianship because a lot of us came into this profession without being our first choice. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness for that um, because we had mentors, we had uh, people who took us under our wings and showed us what we could do the possibilities. And I was part of the first Spectrum Scholar cohort. Woo! And with that, um, enabled me to see how I could speak and advocate. And not only that, but do other areas in my life and social justice was just part of me and seeing how it all is connected together. So I thank you and I want to, apo you, I want to apologize for not being in the work, but now seeing that I need to be in the work, mm -hmm. in the trenches, really on committees and working in Maryland. When our director of public services, who was going on to ULC, uh, Michelle Hamiel, became president, uh, short-lived because she will be coming to DC. But I told her, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you. I'm looking forward to doing more um, on the state level. So I'm looking forward to doing more with um, Black Caucus as well. So thank you so much for the inspiration that you've given me today. Thank you, that was great. But you asked a, a poignant question, what do we do? We have to think about the future and we have to think about how our libraries are set up. So many of us who are in the positions that we're in is because we started as maybe a page in the library and we worked our way up. I'm fortunate and I'm thankful to New York Public Library that they had the trainee position to pay for me to go to library school. But how many of our libraries have those opportunities? Because money is a factor, we have to think about that. We also have to think about ourselves. Are we competing with the other person of color that's on staff? We should have that crabs in a barrel mentality that Nichelle and I are always thinking about. Uh, when you're part of a professional organization that you're paying for, BCLA, we really wanna make sure that we are shining our members because we know that it's very important when you're going for those jobs that you can say in the resume that you spoke here, you've done this, you wrote this. And so you want to really, really utilize the professional organization that you're part of. So all of these students who are part of this organization for free, be part of a committee because that is important when you go for jobs. But people who are already in their job position, what else are you thinking about going for? Do the work within the organization so you can showcase that you have that talent. And I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but we have to think about what we're supposed to do. And, and President Burns, since yeah, let me jump in and add one thing. So our organization is open to everyone. Yes. Non-librarians, trustees, board members, CERC staff, pages, 
everyone is welcome and there's no hierarchy. Um, so if you're advocating and you love libraries, then we, we want you to be a part of BCALA. So there's enough sun to shine on all of us. Uh, there's enough adulation and light and love and everything for everyone. And so I would ask you to come on board um, so that we can help your light shine. Absolutely. We have time for one question because then we got to go to our reception. Go ahead. Oh, we have a virtual. Oh, I have it. Thank you. Look at this. All right. So what? Okay, question. How can we get our library boards to be more accountable in moving forward these initiatives that the panelists discuss in the library systems for which they Can serve? I handle that question? Yeah, please do. Okay. Please. So what you need to do, your library board serves you. You need to see who the appointing agencies are and put pressure to, on them if they're not being responsive. You need to attend the library board meetings, pay attention to what's happening, and dare I say it, follow the money. So if there are a lot of buildings, but we're not adding to the compensation for the employees, there's a problem. So we have to advocate, uh, bring in numbers, bring in your neighbors, uh, friends, frenemies, in-laws, outlaws, and advocate for the things that you want. They need to represent you, uh, but you need to advocate and put that pressure. Let me add to that. Let me add to that. One of the other things, not only do we need to advocate within the institution, but you need to have your, your community speak out. Because a lot of times, they're not listening to people that work at the library because it seems to be like it's a self-serving. But when the community speaks out, and complains and they ask questions, they respond to the community. So I would advocate for you get the community to support what you want to get done in your library as well. And what changes need to take place in your library, the community should take place. And you can see that happen, what happened in Smithtown, Long Island, making decisions and then the community, the state, the politicians spoke out against it, they changed their voice. So that, that's an important thing that you need to do. Thank you. So you have to leave the four walls of the building outreach. I did see one hand, so I, I want to. Yes. Sure. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, like I said, it just started as an Instagram page, but it quickly grew. People wanted to do meetups and different things like that and um, sharing job opportunities. So I would just say um, we can connect and we can um, plan and we can help promote a meetup for uh, local Black librarians in your area. Anytime anybody wants to have some type of meetup or something like that, I'm always open to promote. I want to bring awareness to what everybody has going on. So if there's something you want to put together, just let me know and we will definitely share it out and um, try to get um, other Black librarians in your, um, in your area on board with that. And in addition to that, I'd like to advocate that we would love to have an affiliate in the state of Georgia. So I would love to connect with you uh, and see how we can stand that up. So we're here to support. We have Dr. Walker who is in Georgia and she might be able to be a sponsor or something. I'm telling her to do something, but she definitely has a wealth of experience. Uh, but we would love to do that. So there's a lot more room in the tent. And so anyone who's interested in having an affiliate in their area, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll have my business cards and I'll be at the reception. Thank you. President. Okay, so let's go to the reception. We have our panelists here. Yeah. Before you leave, two more points. One is if you read this work, then you also inherit the responsibility to read the earlier works by E.J. Josie. If you don't know who E.J. Josie was, if you don't know what BC, how BCLA got founded and why it was founded, then you're, you're cheating yourself. 
the earlier volumes of not just the 21st century black librarian, but the earlier volumes that EJ wrote. So you can see what was like in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but also see how much has not changed. The other thing is at the local level, there are affiliate organizations around the country that you could be involved in with DCLA and the state and local level, and not just worry about the, the national level. So you have a role to play. And it also, it means that we need to change the culture of our graduate schools so that this is taught in the graduate school as part of your education. And part of your foundation of what this profession was and what, what changes that have been brought about by activist librarians like EJ and, and Effie Lee Morris and Tom Alford and the others. Um, the, I, when I looked at the history of BCLA, I see the, the parallel between the civil rights struggle in America and the black culture, the, the culture of what was happening in librarianship, the changes that were needed in ALA is a parallel of what was going on in this country when they were holding conferences in countries where we couldn't stay at the hotels, we couldn't eat at the restaurants, we couldn't even ride in the same elevator with white librarians. That has changed because of people like E.J. Josie. But if you're not taught that as part of your edu education, then you've been cheated in your graduate school. So the cultures in the graduate schools needs to change as well. Okay. Uh, make sure you pass the collection plate over to uh... Cool, he's and I'm also good. a professor of, of library science at Queens College, and I do that as part of my course. Yeah. They are introduced to B.J. Josie and these books as part of their education. And you can purchase this book yes, at uh, please. Little Phil and Rowan, or Rowan and Little Phil. Rowan and Little Phil, yes. <laughs> and they're yeah. our publishers, so you can look for it online. It's selling like hotcakes, so we're very, very excited. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for all the virtual people. They're really excited. They say they're ready to do the work, Nichelle, so take names. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one.